I am going to hand it over to Esty Rose, who will be presenting on J, J screen. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Esty and I'm a genetic counselor for JScreen. Um, so JScreen recently um, found eye care when we were looking for good resources for our patients who test positive for cancer genetic mutations. Um, and we thought it would be a good idea just to introduce all of you to JScreen and to our program um, so that you could keep us in mind when you have patients who might need genetic testing. So a little bit about me, um, I got my master's in genetic counseling at Mount Sinai. Um, after that, I worked in New York at Montefiore Medical Center for a few years doing both prenatal and cancer genetic counseling. Um, and I've been with JScreen for the last five years um, doing reproductive carrier screening and cancer testing as well. So a little bit about JScreen. So JScreen actually started in Atlanta. Um, in 2008, there was a family down in Atlanta named Caroline and uh, Randy Gold, and they already had a son and were thinking of having another child, um, and they had Eden, who's their second child, their daughter. Um, after a couple of months, they started to notice that Eden um, wasn't meeting the developmental milestones that she should have been reaching at that age, and they took her for many um, doctor's visits and genetics visits, and finally she was diagnosed with a condition that is spelled wrong here, I'm realizing now, um, but it's called mucolipidosis uh, type 4. Um, which is a condition that's very common in people who are Ashkenazi Jewish. Um, Eden is, I think, 13 or 12 years old now, um, and she it has a lot of delays. She has neurological delays, um, she's going blind, and she's severely affected with this condition. Um, now, when they were, before they got pregnant with Eden, um, they went to go see their doctor just to discuss, you know, prenatal testing or preconception, uh, preconception testing. Um, the doctor noticed that they were both Ashkenazi Jewish and said, oh, you have to do your genetic testing for Tay-Sachs and other common Jewish genetic diseases, but the doctor did not test them for mucolipidosis 4, for ML4. Um, the gene for this condition had recently been um, isolated and genetic testing was recently available for this condition, but not all the labs had caught on by that point yet. So some labs were testing for it, some labs were not. Now all the labs test for it, but at that point, some labs did and some did not. Um, unfortunately, the Golds found out the hard way that they were both carriers for this condition, and that's why Eden was affected. Um, so this couple decided that this cannot and will not happen to anybody else in the community. Um, and they started a local program called the Atlanta Gene Screen, where they would test people of reproductive age in the Atlanta area um, for common genetic diseases. So here's a couple of pictures of Eden. Uh, this is Randy, her father, speaking publicly about it. He made um, a big splash in the Jewish community uh, regarding education uh, related to genetic testing. Um, over the course of time, they said, you know, this shouldn't just be an Atlanta issue, it should be for Jewish people across the country. So that's what inspired the beginning of JScreen. So before JScreen actually started, um, Emory, where um, they were diagnosed or where Eden was diagnosed, decided to commission a market research survey, kind of learning a little bit about the community to see how well they knew about genetic issues and whether you know it was a good idea to bring this to the community. And they found that 24% of Jews uh, from the area who were of reproductive age were aware of their risk and had been screened, only 24%. Um, and they found that 40% were unaware of their risk. They didn't know that being Jewish made them an increased risk to carry these conditions. So these numbers were pretty, pretty bad, pretty alarming, um, because they saw that there was a need for education in the community um, and obviously a need for testing as well. So before they set out to do this on a national level, they needed to figure out what the barriers to testing were, um, and they wanted to overcome those barriers with this new program. So what they came up with, sorry, there we go. Um, Okay, so they wanted to bring awareness to the community. They wanted to bring screening to people's doorsteps. Um, they wanted to make it accessible from coast to coast. So it's not just for people in the Atlanta area. It could be for anybody, especially in areas where genetic counselors aren't available or there isn't, you know, many, there aren't many Jewish people where their doctor would even ask them and, you know, offer genetic testing. Um, so they needed to make it available to anybody, even in areas where it's less accessible. Um, they wanted to make it simple and convenient and affordable as well. Another really important part of the program was to make sure that people had medical input and they had support from genetic counselors along the way because they didn't feel that it was a good idea to just email people results without talking to them about the results. So that's how they came up with this at-home genetic testing model. Um, this was like pretty exciting for 2012. Nowadays, it's pretty common for people to do at-home testing and to do telehealth and telegenetic counseling. But at the time, it was, it was pretty rogue what they did. Um, this is not actually what it looks like. There's no bow on it when it comes. It's just a FedEx package. But doing at 
that home testing was a really exciting and innovative way to break these barriers and to provide testing in an affordable and accessible way. So the first year um, was pretty good, I would say, for JScreen. Um, there were a lot of naysayers in the genetics community, unfortunately, myself included, when it started. There were a lot of questions about doing at-home testing and using saliva samples, for, uh, especially for Tay-Sachs, where you can't do enzyme testing. And people didn't they didn't buy it from the beginning. You know, there there definitely were people who weren't too excited about it. But um, the people at JScreen um, did publish a paper after their first year, kind of reflecting on how the telehealth model worked, and it then it worked really well. And over the years, things kind of caught on, and JScreen became a really popular resource within the Jewish community. Um, over the course of years, when especially when ACMG um, decided that maybe we should be doing more comprehensive testing, um, now we're offering a much larger panel for diseases, not just Ashkenazi diseases. We have a pan-ethnic panel that includes over 200 conditions. So the J in J screen is a little bit outdated because now we're not only testing for people with Jewish ancestry, we're testing for people with any ancestry. Anybody who's considering having a child uh, would be appropriate for this test. Um, so this kind of helped us, you know, define our mission, which is to provide affordable and accessible uh, accessible genetic testing and counseling on a national level. So within this mission, you know, there's a lot of leeway and there are other things that we might want to consider besides for doing reproductive uh, carrier screening, and that was cancer testing. So when we went out into the communities to provide education about the importance of carrier screening, we'd always get people raising their hands asking us, well, what about the BRCA testing? Or my mom has a BRCA mutation, or I saw an article in the Times about Angelina Jolie, or, you know, I ordered a 23andMe test to learn about my ancestry and they also did BRCA testing. There was a lot of buzz in the community and people we saw knew that BRCA mutations were more common in people of Ashkenazi ancestry and they were interested in getting tested for it. And for many, many years, we said, no, like this is just not what we do. We do reproductive carrier screening. We're not testing for personal health issues or adult onset conditions. We're only testing to see whether people are carriers for conditions that can affect their children in the future. Um, but we kept getting questions and emails all the time. And we decided maybe it would be a good idea to consider doing this test. So we did a couple of pilots to kind of figure out if this is something that we should be doing. Um, back in 2019, uh, we had a couple of on-site screening events at Different, on different campuses, and we asked people who came for their reproductive carrier screening whether they would be interested in also doing BRCA screening. Uh, we asked it in a couple of ways, but here's just an example of one of the questions that we asked. We said, if testing were available today, would you be interested in finding out whether you carry a BRCA mutation? And the overwhelming majority of people said yes. So people are asking about it, people are emailing about it, people are telling us that they're interested in it. It looks like the community really wants this. So before we just jumped right into it, uh, we did a pilot study in the Atlanta area. Uh, the study was called the Peach BRCA study. Uh, the study is now over and we submitted a manuscript, so it's not out just yet, but I'll give you some um, sneak peeks into some of the things that we learned. So part of the study um, was to test people who live in the Atlanta area for BRCA mutations only. So we didn't do a whole panel. We only tested for BRCA. We did sequencing. Um, in order to be eligible for the study, people had to be at least 25 years old, have one Ashkenazi grandparent, live in that area in Atlanta and be low risk, which we basically figured out based on NCCN criteria. So people would give us um, their family history and their personal history information. And based on NCCN, we would decide whether they could be part of the study or not. We only accepted people who did not meet NCCN criteria or who were considered low risk. Um, once they were accepted into the study, they watched a short educational video. Um, everybody watched the same video, with, which was basically um, a way to do pretest counseling. And then when the results came in, everybody got a genetic counseling appointment with one of our genetic counselors. Um, they were able to do it by phone or by Zoom. And they also answered a couple of surveys along the way. People who were not eligible, there were about 500 people who were not eligible based on their personal and family history. Um, they were emailed um, surveys after the study was over, um, asking them what they did with this information after learning that they were not eligible. Um, I forgot to mention before, when we told them they were not eligible, we gave them a resource to go for genetic counseling in their area. Um, we sent them to the Winship Cancer Institute, which is a uh, part of Emory, um, for a more comprehensive genetic counseling session because based on their history that they provided to us, we thought they needed or they might need more than just BRCA testing and they wouldn't be appropriate for the study. So once the study was over, we went back to all of those people and asked them whether they did follow up with a genetic counselor um, and why or why not. Um, they did that. So here were some of the results. Um, of the 500 people that we tested, four tested positive, which is about 0.8% positivity rate. 
Um, some other interesting things that we learned from the study, um, we asked people when they were done, had they been offered a multi-gene cancer panel, not just BRCA, would they have been interested in that? And many people said yes, 87.1% of people were interested in doing more than just BRCA testing. Um, in fact, the lab that did our testing for the study in Vitae, they offered a free upgrade to anybody who came through the study. So when they came through their genetic counseling, uh, we offered them to go through their doctor to do an upgraded test, so a larger panel. And of those, 84 people ended up going ahead with the testing. And here are some of those results. We had a couple of positives and a couple of BUSs. Um, another interesting finding that we found um, through the study is we asked people how they felt about the pretest education through the, the video, that standardized video, and an overwhelming majority of people said they didn't think that there was any problem with it and they wouldn't change that. Um, another interesting thing is that of the ineligible people that we surveyed um, to see whether or not they continued on with genetic counseling, an overwhelming majority did not go to see a genetic counselor. And here are some of the reasons as to why they didn't go. Um, they didn't know how to get a referral, they were worried about insurance coverage and cost, or they didn't have the time. So, you know, all of these things combined made us realize that this is something that we really could be doing and should be doing, and that the at-home testing and genetic counseling model really works when it comes to cancer testing too. So we had to get our, you know, get it out of our heads that we're only a reproductive carrier screening program and that we can also provide um, cancer testing to those who need it. Um, and so we did, we started to offer it um, last January. So we just, um, reach our one year anniversary since we launched our test. Um, if you go to our website, jscreen.org, you'll see that we offer two different tests now, our Reprogen test, which is for uh, reproductive carrier screening and our cancer gen test, which is for cancer screening. Um, people who come in have the option to do either test or they can do a combo where they get a little bit of a discount um, and they would get tested for both uh, panels at the same time. So here's a little bit about our process, whether you're um, going in for the repro or the cancer test. You go to our website, you request your kit. Um, most people who come through JScreen are self-referred. So they hear about us you know, through our outreach, through their family or through their friends, um, or they Google it and they find us. Um, we also get quite a number of MD referrals and we also, pre-COVID um, would go to um, different places to do on-site screening events. So in different communities and different campuses and synagogues, um, there's many ways that people could reach us. Um, part of the registration process, whether you're doing the repro or the cancer test, um, is to watch a pre-test education video, which we saw with our study went really well. So we have two separate videos, um, one for repro and one for cancer. Um, they register, they give us their doctor's information and we reach out to their doctor to get the order signed for them. Um, so their doctor knows that they're doing this test. Then we send them their kit or kits, depending on what they order. They return it in the mail, and then we get the results, and we discuss the results over the phone or by Zoom, whichever one the patient uh, prefers. And then we send all the results to their doctor. Um, patients who test positive or at a higher risk for anything, um, they also get a phone, their doctor gets a phone call as well. So we're not just faxing the results, we're also speaking to the doctor and making sure that they've received the results um, so that you know, we can ask them if they have any questions or you know, we can help them with any resources that they might need. Uh, here's the pricing for our tests. So this is our pricing as of today. Things might change. Uh, a little bit about both panels. I saw that somebody had asked. So our ReproGen panel um, tests for 200, it's really 226 genes because we test for Fragile X for our female patients. Um, the purpose of this test is really for reproductive purposes. It's not a diagnostic test. Every now and then we will pick up people who are at risk for symptoms themselves of certain conditions, but that's not the intent of our test. It's really just for reproductive purposes. Um, as such, most of the conditions that we're testing for are recessive. So carriers are generally not symptomatic. There are a couple of excellent conditions as well. Um, this test is for, geared towards people of reproductive age. So we kind of set the guidelines from 18 to 45, but there are some exceptions if needed. Um, the test is appropriate for both men and women um, of Ashkenazi, Sephardic, convert, mixed, not Jewish, really anybody considering having a child should get tested. Um, and it's available in all 50 states. Our cancer gen panel tests for 63 different cancer susceptibility genes. Um, both this test and our ReproGen test was created by our genetic counselors. It's a very carefully curated list of genes that we're testing for. Um, we had to meet pretty strict criteria when we decided which genes to include or not include. Um, basically, our criteria for the cancer gen um, panel was, are these genes actionable? Can we tell people who are positive that there's something that they can do about it? Um, these these 
panels do change over time. So this is just, you know, current, but we always tell people that they should keep up with things because they might change um, in the future and more testing or more comprehensive testing might be available um, later on. Um, this test is for anybody ages 21 and older, men and women, doesn't make a difference what their background is. And um, like with our ReproGen test, it's for anybody in the U.S. But we have reached um, 50 different states, all those states for the ReproGen test. And just in the one year that we've had our cancer gen test, uh, we've reached 44 states. Um, we have more female patients than males, about 15,000 females and 11,000 yeah, and 11,000 males. Um, a number that we're really proud of is our number of pregnant patients. Only 11.4% of our female patients um, are pregnant, um, which is a, is a pretty good number. You know, part of our education for our ReproGen panel is to try to catch people before pregnancy and to learn about their risks, because if we see that there's an at-risk couple, um, it's better for them to know that before pregnancy so that we can talk to them about more reproductive options. So our pregnant number is pretty low. We're trying to get that lower and lower by educating the community before pregnancy, um, but, you know, we, we seem to be doing a pretty good job at that. Um, our ReproGen patients are between the ages of 18 and 94. Our cancer gen patient, patients are between the ages of 18, not supposed to say 89. I'm sorry, this is an old version. Um, positives, um, we have a 13.1% positivity rate for our cancer gen test, which is a pretty impressive number. Um, these, a lot of these people um, are coming just because they're interested, not necessarily because they have a personal or family history. So, uh, you know, we're seeing a bunch of positives for people who didn't really expect to be positive. Um, so 13.1, you know, a pretty significant number. Um, we've also partnered with many different organizations um, as a resource for people. So I don't know if you've heard of any of these, but here are a couple of uh, cancer organizations that we've recently partnered with to help us spread the word about testing um, and to um, sometimes provide grant funding for people to get tested if they can't afford the, the price of the test. Um, there are also good resources for support. Um, and um, if anybody could think of any other partnerships that would be helpful to us, please let me know. And here's my contact information if anybody's interested. Um, I thank you all for listening and for learning about JScreen. Um, we hope to be, you know, more well known in the, the cancer genetics community. So if anybody has any patients or any ways to collaborate with us, please let me know. Thank you, Esty. That was really an excellent presentation. Um, I'm wondering, do we want to get out of the presentation mode? There you go. Perfect. Uh, there were some questions that were asked. I think you addressed one of the questions, which is, is JScreen just for Ashkenazi Jewish clients? And I think the answer to that is no. Yeah, I would say the answer to that is not anymore. Um, when we started out, we really were geared towards that community because we were doing targeted testing. But now that we have reproductive, now that we have universal carrier screening panels um, and the cancer uh, genes are also pretty universal, we're testing anybody who's interested in coming through. Okay, and then we have two questions here that are kind of related, uh, clarifying the cancer genes currently being offered and um, asking to if you would be willing to provide a list of the genes on your current cancer panel. Yeah, I could share my screen. Um... Can you see this? Yes, now we okay. can see it. Okay, so um, this panel is special just for JScreen. So it's an Invite panel, but nobody else can order this test. This is just um, for our use. Um, and here is a list of the genes. I'll kind of scroll through them. Um, if anybody has any specific questions about anything, I'm happy to help. And is this available on your website? Yeah, it's on our website. So you can find it under uh, cancer screening. If we believe um, that somebody needs additional testing beyond um, any of these 63 genes, um, we can order it through in vitae. That's why taking a pedigree is really important for the process. Um, if we see that there is a family history of something that could be better addressed with one of their you know, organ specific panels, we can add it for them. So you may want to reconsider NBN because NBN, we're really not sure about anymore. Yeah, as actually, you know. <laughs> yeah, I actually just got an update for a patient of ours through Invitae that they no longer believe there's an association with breast cancer. Um, so that was an interesting uh, re-counseling session. Um, yeah, it's something that's on our radar. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm Nicolette, I'm from Providence. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
So uh, we start using the RNA DNA. I know that the Invita offers that. And actually yesterday was my first patient that she was diagnosed, we identified with an ATM mutation through the RNA. Um, so how would you see this panel in the future? We know that Invita will only offer two panels, RNA, DNA, the 47 gene or the 84 genes. Um, definitely the patient will need to have a blood draw um, for that because only will accept sample uh, for the DNA, RNA. How would you see that in the future? Because I know that most of the, you know, telegenetics companies like uh, Genome Medical and other, they use mostly saliva. Yes, it's easier, it's faster. Uh, but how do you see that in the future now that we have these options? Yeah, so same with us. We haven't really seen it too much yet. I think we might have only had one patient that was eligible for the RNA testing. Um, so we can get the lab to send them blood kits if needed. Um, they'll have to either find somebody local who could draw their blood for them, or we can hook them up with, um, with a phlebotomy company that's close by. So it's definitely doable. We'll have to kind of evaluate and see, you know, if we're getting a lot of these RNAs, then we might have to change our process a little bit. Um, but so far, we're, we're not there yet. So, you know, Esty, it's interesting in our own practice, and other people may have found this as well, and I think it was Brenda that made the observation, that when we use RNA and we go the extra step of phlebotomy, and your population may be different, but in the clinic population, our uptake of testing, completed testing, actually increases too. Oh. So it's actually not been a deterrent, especially because the labs are so good about sending out mobile phlebotomy. Yeah, especially at VTA, they're great to work with. Um, again, we don't have so much experience just yet, but they're really, really like their client services is amazing. And people are interested. You know, these are people, like I said, most people are self-referred. So these are people who want results. So you have, do, you have a is, motivated population. Very, very motivated. So <coughs> I, it's, it's pretty rare for us to have cancellations or people who don't complete their testing or never send in their kit. Um, in our population, I know it's not like that in all cancer clinics, but in our population, these are people who are highly motivated and will go that extra step to get their blood drawn. The issue with in vitae, and that this may change over time, is you can't do RNA on a customizable panel. So you see what I mean? So you have your 62 genes, but for their, my understanding at least, Brenda, correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. I they, thought... they still, I think they're working on it, but they have their two fixed panels. Yeah, uh, they have the 47, so the common then, hereditary cancer or the multi-cancer panel. Mm -hmm. And it's then if you, one... if you do a custom panel, uh, or even if you do one of their smaller panels, you yeah. cannot add RNA. They they only and also you RNA. cannot do a stat. You cannot do a stat and reflex to a DNA RNA. Yeah. I know um, they're aware of it and I think they're working on yes, it. Yes, yes, definitely. Well, yeah, the competition offered that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so no, that's why. Say. And we, we try and be <laughs> lab agnostic for this, but yeah, that, that's what goes into some of our decisions for which labs we order from. Um, some other questions that you're getting a lot of questions, Esty. Uh, when is the pedigree taken? Um, so we, as soon as somebody registers, we send them a family history tool, which is basically a survey that they fill out. It's through Invitae. It's like one of their tools. Um, they fill it out and um, it generates a pedigree for us. So we see it. They have access to it if they want. They can print it out in a PDF version. So they have it and they can share it with their doctor. Um, and it's really helpful for us for the genetic counseling. Okay. So it's a requirement. Okay. It's something that they can't move on with the process without doing that family history. Okay. And then anyone is eligible. Okay. So that was just a comment. Yeah. Somebody, somebody said that uh, somebody's asking, what do you mean by we've only had one patient who was eligible for RNA testing? Yeah. They put it on the lab report. And I'm I know you guys have mentioned that not it's only for the two panels, but I think we've had one. It wasn't my patient. So I, I might be wrong, but well, anyone, I think the point is anyone can have RNA testing. It's a free add on. For anyone, it just requires a blood test. So there's no specific eligibility requirement for RNA at this point I, in time. I think the eligibility was when Invita found something that they need clarification through an RNA. Uh, and that's when they mentioned that. But uh, yes, indeed, now they offer for anybody DNA, RNA. 
um, no. uh, those two panels. However, not all the insurance will cover those panels. So there are some insurance that will only stick with the BRC1 and 2 and other genes uh, if the patient meets that, and they will only offer a DNA, like a stat breast panel or a breast, um, you know, the breast panel. Um, so sometimes there is the insurance uh, so these are these are I think these are two different uh, issues or questions. You know, you can use RNA to clarify variants, and then you mm -hmm. can use RNA to run um, in parallel with DNA. Those are completely different. Yeah, yeah and I think this so is Emily. what it sounds like. So Emily Goldberg is saying the patient, the per, the person ST is referring to, is a follow up testing on a VUS that RNA analysis may help. Which, which the labs have been doing for a while now before they yeah. offer the paired RNA testing. They've been doing variant classification through RNA for okay, a while. So I have some other questions that I do think are important to clear up. Is JScreen part of Invitae or Independent Testing Counseling Service? It's a not-for-profit that um, I think is kind of funneled through Emory, but its own entity from what SD yeah, had mentioned. Yeah, I don't really know if you wanted to mention that, but I think it's important to say that you're independent. You are not part of a lab. Yeah, we are not part of our lab. We just send our samples to Invitae. Um, for our ReproGen panel, we use uh, Myriad, actually. So we, we're, you know, partnered with both labs. Um, we are a non-for-profit, but we're based out of Emory's Department of Genetics. So we have their genetics um, people as our directors, and we can always, you know, ask questions if we have to. They help us make decisions, um, but we're kind of sitting in a funny place because we're in Emory, but we're really a non-profit based out of one division of Emory. So I have another question here from Georgia. Uh, it's I think th that this is an interesting program. In the choice of tests, it seems as if you are close to ordering diagnostic tests rather than screening. How is this handled in your program? Yeah, we we, are try, we try to be really careful about using the word screening. Um, for our reprogen test, you know, we're not diagnosing people with diseases. We're trying really, really hard to explain that to people. Um, even when people do come out with two mutations, we never say you have this disease. So, you know, a common one we'll see is familial Mediterranean fever um, or CAH. You know, a lot of times we'll see people who have two mutations and we're not going to say you have FMF. We're not diagnosing them with that FMF. We're going to send them to a specialist who can diagnose them with that. Um, but we'll tell them that they're at risk for symptoms of that condition. So we're really, really careful with the words that we're using. Same thing with our cancer tests. You know, this is a screening test. We're telling people that they're at increased risk. We're not telling them that they have, you know, any kind of cancer. And that's where the genetic counseling component really comes in. And, you know, this is why I'm so passionate about this program is because we have that genetic counseling support and we can sit there and explain it to people who are very often confused about the differences. Well, it's interesting to me because you started as a Jewish screening program, which is the name. So at some point you may want to add to yeah. the name or... <laughs> We're definitely uh, reconsidering that. <laughs> Other questions? I mean, this is really excellent. Thank you so much for presenting. Yeah, thank you for having me. I think this is like just a great place to introduce ourselves and let people know that we exist um, in certain parts of the country, especially when there's just where there's just, you know, less access to genetic counselors. Um, that's really the places that we're targeting, you know, and, and, and the beauty of this is this is not through a lab. This is independent genetic counselor. So I think that is really, really important to emphasize here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Oh, the cost of test slides. Should I bring that back up? Or you can even talk through it. Yeah. Um, there it is, if you can see. So um, we offer a cheaper price for people who are providing insurance information. Um, for those people who don't have insurance or don't want to give their insurance information, we offer them a self-pay price. Um, and you can see that if people order both tests at the same time, uh, there's a discount. And this is coverage for the testing and the counseling. Yeah, we call it a program fee um, just to kind of cover everything associated with it. So everybody pays this 
this program fee, regardless of what their insurance ends up covering. Um, if their insurance covers the testing, that's great. If they don't, then we have subsidies to help subs you know, offset that, those costs. Um, so it covers the testing, the processing, the handling, the genetic counseling. Um, and many of our patients come back you know, all the time with questions. So we're here for our patients, not just you know, the first two weeks that they're in with us, like we're here forever. Um, and we're happy to help anybody who's come our way. So I have another question here. Um, is your genetic counseling only for people undergoing genetic testing? What if people want genetic counseling, but no test? And I'm going to follow up because I also had a question related to this. When you give the results, are you offering genetic counseling for positives, negatives, and VUSs or just positives? How does that work? So we don't offer in count, we don't offer counseling services for anybody. It's only for our patients. They have to sign consent forms and you know be part of our program. So if somebody has a question um, and they're not testing, we'll give them you know educational answers, but we don't get too specific with people because we can't really provide counseling to people who are not our patients. Um, usually we'll send them a link to um, NSGC so that people can visit a local genetic counselor. So our real genetic counseling, you know, one-on-one -on -one personalized counseling is only for people who come through us. Um, regarding who who gets genetic counseling, um, all of our negatives, or pretty much all of our negatives with some exceptions, are emailed their results, but also given a link to um, register for an appointment with a genetic counselor if they're interested. Um, our VUSs are all sent for genetic counseling as are our positives. So you, that's something you should include in a future publication, like what is the uptake? for negatives. Yeah, yeah. That information. And that. say it's a negative patient with a positive family history. Is there a trigger for them to still get genetic counseling, right? Because they're not yeah. low risk. Yeah. And we put that in our results email. We say like, even though you're negative, we still recommend that you consider seeing a genetic counselor because there are other things we can tell you, you know, related to your personal or family history. Sometimes we'll do a tyrocusic on people and we'll, you know, help them get coverage for mammograms, you know, so there's, something to it, even if they're negative. Obviously, I believe in that. But you, um, why don't you offer genetic counseling to those negatives with a positive family history? We do. We offer it to everybody, but we don't require it. Got so it. for, yeah, for the positives and the VUSs, we don't release the results until they have the genetic counseling. For our oh, negatives, we do the opposite. We release the results and then also tell them at the same time, and it would be great if you saw a genetic counselor. Okay. Georgia has a great question. I'm curious about this too now. Yeah. Are the test results and genetic counseling put in the Emory medical record? No, they're only at JScreen. Okay. And what about licensing? So you guys must be licensed in every state that- so many licenses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are. Uh, we're not licensed in three of the states that require licensing, um, specifically just because those three states are not, you know, big states for us. Um, and the- cost and effort involved in being licensed in those states are not worthwhile for us. But for people who do come from those states, um, they can always go to Invite for their counseling. So they provide genetic counseling services like backup for us, um, and they're licensed everywhere. So if we see that somebody is from one of those states that we're not licensed in, we'll send them there. Okay. All right. So thank you again. <laughs> yeah, it was really nice to be here. Thank you so much.